Hey everybody and welcome back. Today we're going to continue working through the NPCs of Stardew Valley. Last time we talked about Leo and that was a whole time. Today we're going to cover the final villager in Stardew Valley that cannot become either a spouse or a roommate. Sandy doesn't have a lot of dialogue, but that doesn't stop us from being so intrigued by this random shopkeep hanging out in the middle of the desert for no apparent reason. Let's take a few minutes here and think about what we actually know about Sandy. Sandy is the owner, or at least manager, maybe, of the Oasis, the only permanent structure located in the desert. The Oasis is the only source of some of the game's most profitable crops, including the greatly coveted and sometimes debated starfruit, but even rhubarb and beets are fantastic crops when you break down the income compared to the time it takes to grow them. So if you're not full up on ancient fruit already, you might want to consider grabbing at least a few seeds from the Oasis each season. More interestingly, to me at least, is that Sandy sells Deluxe Speed Grow for only 80 gold. It's only available on Thursdays, which is kind of a bummer, but you can get it from the very first Thursday, and at 80 gold, it's nearly half as expensive as buying from Pierre, who doesn't even carry it until the second year of the game. But yeah, long story short, while the Oasis doesn't have the variety that Pierre's does, the things that you can buy there are really, really good. Also, I guess she also sells furniture, so that's cool. As long as I'm talking about a more general desert overview, there is technically another vendor who sets up shop near the bus stop. Someone very important to those of us who like to dive deep into the Skull Caverns, and also to Krobus fans. The desert trader sells all kinds of things from warp totems to magic rock candy to staircases. She's an invaluable resource for deep dives into the Skull Caverns, and I've really appreciated having her here since the 1.4 update. And I can confidently say she because while working on this video, I found out that Sandy says, I think she sells some rare products, in reference to the trader. I actually honestly did not know that, so neat. I'm sure there are a billion videos out there about trading jade for staircases, but consider this your reminder to put jade in a crystallarium to trade for staircases on Sundays, so that you can power through the skull cavern and rub it in Mr. Key's face. Okay, back to the oasis, and then back to Sandy. It's kind of roundabout, okay? Even though the Oasis is where Sandy spends 99.61% of her time, she actually doesn't have a bedroom here. <laughs> that doesn't mean that the Oasis doesn't have more to offer, it's just that I guess we needed a casino upstairs more than Sandy needed a place to sleep, so yeah, I don't know. When you complete the mysterious Mr. Key quest by running errands for your overlord, you can make your way upstairs to meet the man himself. This is another place I like to go when I've loaded up with cash in the late game because those statues of endless fortune are absolutely wild, and I also kind of honestly use them like a calendar just to remind me that it's somebody's birthday. And while Sandy doesn't ever go up into the casino herself, she is aware that something weird is going on upstairs. In her four heart dialogue, or at least one of them, Sandy will tell you that there's some kind of exclusive club up there, but that they pay her a generous rent, so she basically just doesn't do anything about it. This is a really interesting line of dialogue, and I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm gonna ignore it because it doesn't fit my narrative at all. So what is that narrative you ask? Well, yeah, okay, I think we've laid enough groundwork here, so let's, uh, yeah, let's get down to business. We are gonna take a look at a few lines of dialogue and wildly extrapolate a theory based on some super flimsy evidence here, the best kind of video. From the very beginning, Sandy doesn't seem like she really wants to be out here in the desert. She says, it's always sunny here, even in winter. Actually, it's a little hot for my tastes. My delicate skin burns quickly in the sun. He'll also tell you, oh yeah, that shady looking guy in the back, you know, I'm not really supposed to talk about it. And then she'll say that she almost went out of business when the bus line went down, right from the start actually. And that's another reason I'm ignoring the part about the casino paying her a generous monthly rent. In fact, Sandy only has a dozen or so lines of dialogue, I think it's like 17 or 18, I'm not 100% sure, but Around a fifth of her lines are actually regarding the bouncer or the casino in some way. When you achieve four hearts with Sandy, she'll tell you that her real name isn't even Sandy, she's just used to people calling her that by now. And finally at ten hearts, Sandy will tell you that she would love to come back to the valley with you at least for a day or two if it weren't for this shop. The Oasis has another visitor literally once in the entire year, and it's just Emily picking up Sandy for their date on Sandy's birthday. She's not even in there to buy anything. So why is Sandy so obsessed with the store? I think there are two possibilities here. I mean, obviously there's a gazillion possibilities, but I have two options that I, I would like to touch on. First off, 
Maybe Sandy is in witness protection. Let's consider this. Sandy doesn't seem to want to live in the desert. She burns too easily. She wishes that she could visit the valley, but she's got to stay here and take care of this store that doesn't have any customers. I think Sandy might have been yanked out of her normal life and forced to go into hiding after some kind of traumatic event, I don't know. And I'm going to make some really dubious connections here. The timelines would need to be a little fuzzy for this to work, but what if Sandy was a key witness for some crime in the valley? I wanted to say maybe a drunk driving accident, but that kind of ruins my next point about transportation, so I don't know. Maybe you can tell me in the comments what might have happened right after you liked the video, haha, <laughs> sorry. So Sandy reports some crime and has to give testimony. It's determined that she cannot live in the valley anymore, and witness protection plops her down into the desert. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they even fake her death, and she was Mona in a past life. There's no working transportation to get to the desert at the beginning of the game, and it's so slow that she's really at no risk of running into anyone she knows. But oh no, she has to leave her girlfriend Emily behind, and she can't do that. So once a year, on Sandy's birthday, Emily comes to visit, and they go on a little date. But she has no other communication with the valley, except, I guess, the male, somehow. The bouncer is actually a full-time bodyguard in this scenario, and the casino is just, gosh, I don't know, just there? This is kind of where this one falls apart. I think it's a really good start, though, but I'm just not sure. Okay, second up, and I think this one is maybe a little more likely. The Oasis, including the casino, is a money laundering operation for Mr. Key. After all, the casino uses its own currency not available anywhere else, and the items there are ones that can't really be turned into any kind of reasonable profit. The casino is just a black box of money. Gold goes in and useless key coins and I guess maybe a rare crow come out. I think this is actually pretty reasonable, and the reason that Sandy is always talking about the bouncer is just as a reminder to maybe the farmer, but maybe also to herself, that she's got someone around to either protect her probably more likely to protect the business, or maybe even to keep her mouth shut. He's an intimidating dude in the corner whose only job is to block a door. And this is no raving club at peak capacity. You know, there's always room at the table for another Calico Jack player. But I think the club card is more about vetting members to make sure they won't squeal than about limiting who gets in based on their ability to put a bunch of vegetables in the mayor's fridge. And Mr. Key makes it a habit to force the player to do some weird rituals to access his most secretive places anyway. It makes sense to me that he would want to protect this operation, and also kind of put it a little bit out of the way. Because in classic money laundering fashion, it doesn't need to be like actually busy to serve its purpose. All Mr. Key needs is the ability to show that customers come in and that money is made. So if you have to take a bus to get there, and there are only a handful of customers, it doesn't really matter. And anywhere you can drop a cool million gold on a statue makes me a little suspicious from the start. Are either of these options supported by in-game dialogue? Well, no, not really. <laughs> but come on! What did you expect me to do with this one? I was legitimately considering a video where I asked whether Sandy was Krobus. Anyway, what do you think about Sandy? Is she in witness protection for squealing on Pam? Is she the face of a money laundering empire for Mr. Key? Or is she, I don't know, a retired real estate baron living on the rent of her tenants and enjoying some time in the sun? Let me know down in the comments what you think, and I'll see you all in the next video.